Greg, thank you so much for that very generous introduction, probably over, overly generous, but I'll accept it. Um, I um, want to say that first uh, that I'm uh, really uh, thrilled uh, to be here and uh, to uh, uh, speak in a conference organized by, by Greg and his colleagues. Uh, it seems to me a wonderfully uh, designed uh, conference. Uh, in the paper that he wrote with um, Christine McLeod, uh, he calls for a synthesis of IP narrow and IP broad, and I think this is just the kind of conference to take important steps in that direction or to stimulate us to do so. Uh, my mind goes back uh, to another kind of synthesis uh, by Charles Darwin 150 years or more ago, uh, who, um, uh, as you know, uh, uh, combined observations on species that were across time and across space. Uh, and here we have uh, a wonderful set of papers that are both across time and across space, across uh, different regimes of political economy, different countries, uh, different cultures, uh, and also uh, historical as well. And this gives rise to a significant kind of um, intellectual uh, stimulus. Uh, certainly made me think a lot uh, in listening to what's have been has happened in Greece and in India uh, uh, and in the u s patent office uh, et cetera et cetera so uh, to turn then to my my subject, I have um, uh, a lot to tell you about, and I hope that you will find it uh, worthwhile for having to have hung around in order to hear this uh, at least you have the wine awaiting you so uh let me begin at what you might think an improbable point. Well, first of all, here is the, uh, the, the topics I'm going to cover. Let me begin at what you might think an improbable point for my subject, and here I'm with plants and the natural commons towards around 1800 in the United States. Um, and, and that is uh, the publication by Benjamin Franklin in Philadelphia in 1751 uh, of an edition of Medicina Britannica by the English physician Thomas Short. This was, here's the cover. This was a treatise on plants as Materia Medica, all of them readily available in Great Britain, the plants were, and a number in the American colonies too, that explained their nature and medical uses. Several of su uh, such handbooks were available in Britain at the time. So why did Franklin choose to publish this one? The answer is manifest in Short's prefatory explanation of how he situated his book amid the practices of contemporary Anglo-American pharmacy. At the time, Materia Medica comprised in the main preparations of plants, mixtures of plants, and a growing number of chemicals. Knowledge of their details and uses had long been confined to experts, the London Pharmacopoeia, for example, had been published only in Latin as late as the 1650s. Popularizers of Materia Medica in English were appearing on the scene, but the most popular, notably Nicholas Culpepper's widely circulated works, which are still published in Britain and the United States, uh, appeared in England in the 1640s and were first published in the American colonies in 1720. They tended to frame both the causes of disease and the drugs to treat them in astrological terms. Many chemical remedies only then emerging from their alchemical antecedents were kept secret, notationally and otherwise. So in the 18th century, uh, in addition, the British Patent Office was issuing a small but increasing number of patents on medicinal plants and chemical mixtures, but patents did not uh, assist disclosure very much. While the British patent system formally required full public disclosure of an inventor's specifications, inventors could and did successfully petition Parliament to keep their patents secret. Chemical inventions gave little away, especially if they comprised medicinal recipes. The Solicitor General told one inquirer that, quote, the remedy is never known, for in the place of the genuine recipe, an absurd and nonsensical one is filed at the office four months after the patent is published. And Greg and Christine have elaborated on this in a, in a, some, a few sentences about uh, non-examination in the, in the British Patent Office, uh, even in the mid, uh, through the mid-19th mid century. 
Now, all this made Thomas Short impatient, our phys British physician, the author of this book. He was a moral man of the British Enlightenment, no more willing to list in his text stimulants of what he called lasciviousness or whoredom than to promote mysterious unproved remedies in medical practice. He declared that his book was not, quote, intended for the learned and gentlemen of the faculty. It was, in contrast, written to be accessible to the poor and their generous benefactors. To this end, he deliberately neglected, as you will see up on the, the let's see, where, uh, I can't remember where it is, I think it's on the right-hand side. Yeah, in the middle of the right-hand side, he, he deliberately neglected the whims of astrological practitioners, of the sundry herbs being under the dominion of such and such planets, and when they were to be gathered, prepared, and used under their respective or opposite planets, or their conjunction or oppositions. He added that his text also omitted, omitted the idle, ridiculous, superstitious uses ascribed to them, that is, the plants, against sorceries, witchcrafts, possessions, and other fooleries, the products of distempered brains, wrong heads, and druids, etc. Now, Short also excluded chemicals from his medicina, finding that reliance on too many compounds and chemical preparations in too great a measure deprives the poor of the benefit of the gifts of kind providence to their frequent loss and often danger. For short, the principal gift of providence was plants, so-called simples, quote-unquote, that is, plants untreated, unmixed, unextracted, meritorious on their own in their virtues, which is the word of the day that meant their medical powers, independently of how the planets were aligned when the plants were plucked from the fields or the herb garden. Now, Benjamin Franklin, who of course was the, an exemplary man of the Enlightenment, was devoted to all that Short stood for, the skeptical empiricism that undergirded the rejection of astrology, the resistance to the arcane and the secret, and the eagerness to make useful and reliable knowledge available to everyone. For this purpose, he enlisted the help of his friend and fellow Philadelphian John Bartram, a nurseryman uh, and one of the world's leading naturalists. Franklin's edition of Short's uh, text included annotations by Bartram as to which of the pl British plants listed by Short were available in the American colonies, as well as a list of plants that were unique to them. Among them was Lobelia, a treatment for syphilis, uh, here is a modern Lobelia, that the Indians used and was, according to Bartram, far more effective than mercury, which was the standard treatment uh, in the uh, pharmacopoeia. Franklin's absorption with physical science and technologies is well known. He extolled the unlocking of the kind of secrets maintained by the craft guilds and endorsed the pirating of forbidden technologies from abroad. Not so well known is his absorption with medicine and agriculture. Franklin himself feared that the promotion of industrial production would victimize labor, but his apprehension was tempered by the belief that the nation's abundant land would provide a safety valve for the heat of oppression. He was, in fact, a devotee of plants. He hoped to find an upland rice for the, United, for the American colonies. He envisioned fields of soy in the colonies, and he regularly sent home plants that he encountered when abroad. Rhubarb, for example, was a favorite that he thought might be useful for either agriculture, medicine, or both. And he thought of plants in the context of the Enlightenment values manifest in Thomas Short's text, that is, as part of a natural commons. That is, a commons comprising not only knowledge of nature, but the parts of nature itself. The commitment was rooted in part in the Protestant tenet that nature and its laws were the works of God, not man, that both were sacred gifts for the use of all of humanity, and that as such, they could, be, <clears throat> they could not be claimed as anyone's property. It also derived from Locke's related philosophical argument that it was unjustifiable to appropriate resources that one could not use and in so doing prevent others from using. 
For Franklin, the materials of nature should not be in and of themselves owned by anyone and should be kept available to all. These values were widely held among Americans of the revolutionary generation, including Thomas Jefferson, especially when it came to patents. Jefferson was adamantly opposed to patents at the time of the Constitutional Convention, but Madison convinced him that he should uh, support them. So he gave way to Madison, though he later regretted it. So Jefferson, let's see, I thought I had a slide of Jefferson. I guess I left that out. Okay. Um, Jefferson himself wrote the definition of what could be patented into the Patent Act of 1793. You've seen this before today, I forget where, uh, which talk, but let me just repeat it here to show it to you again because it's relevant to this notion of a natural commons. So in 1793, what's patentable is any new and useful art, machine, manufacture, or composition of matter, or any new and useful improvement on any art, machine, blah, blah, blah. In 2014, when I produced this slide, what it says in the core of the U.S. patent law is pretty much the same. Okay? So Jefferson hand uh, is still with us in the definition, at least in U.S. patent law, of what is patentable. But with regard to the natural commons, the requirement of novelty maintained the natural commons because it implied that the naturally occurring elements in the periodic table or the vegetables and creatures of the earth were not patentable because they were not uh, new and not man-made compositions of matter, machines, or manufacturers. Okay? So new is twice in the definition of what's patentable. New and useful or new and useful improvements. Now, the patent statutes in the United States, the new United States, did not explicitly articulate the ineligibility of patents, uh, for patents, of what nature produced. And through the first third or more of the 19th century, neither did the courts, the commissioners of patents, nor the textbooks on patent law. But it was clear enough that plants were not patentable. Everyone took them to be public goods, freely available to all for agricultural and medicinal purposes. Mainstream physicians denigrated and refused to prescribe patented medicines, some of which made their way to the United States from England, associating them with the secrecy, secrecy and hence untestability of British productions. Instead, taking a leaf from Thomas Short's text, they made medical botany a branch of medical training and disseminated medical knowledge of vegetable simples widely through handbooks such as uh, the American, Amer a book called American Medical Botany. This is one of the first such books published in the new United States by Jacob Bigelow, who was a president, I mean, a, a professor uh, at Harvard. This is an extensive compendium of medicinal plants native to the United States. It was compiled and annotated, as I've said, by Bigelow, the professor of Materia Medica and Botany at Harvard University. Bigelow illustrated the volume with exquisite watercolors so that physicians... Oh, yeah, Jefferson out of order. Uh, well, I guess I missed up here. Okay. Well, that's the first page instead of, instead of, you can see the illustrations on the left. But the book, every, every plant is identified and illustrated, okay, uh, with watercolors that Bigelow himself uh, made. The, all the books are handmade in that regard, and I commend them to you. You should have a look at it. It's just for the artistic experience. So Bigelow illustrated the volume with exquisite watercolors so that physicians and common readers could readily identify the plants in the field. Before turning to my next section, let me just put in a pitch here, a word for the, the importance of including in plants, a study of the history of plants and intellectual property, the plants as materia medica. Uh, we would profit, I think, from uh, incorporating the history of me the medicinal botany into the history of plants. It's a fascinating uh, and a largely unexplored area in and of itself. Uh, plus, also, uh, it is important for intellectual property because it challenges medical authority in some ways, but is supported by medical authority, uh, and it ramifies into professional ethics, etc. Whereas nowadays we have 
uh, resistance to uh, secrecy and intellectual property protection uh, in plants uh, from uh, uh, social activists, uh, et cetera, uh, and people concerned with the maintenance of the commons. In, in the early 19th century in the United States and elsewhere, we had resistance to it by professional physicians. Uh, and the comparison between the two groups of resistance and the reasons for it uh, would illuminate each case. Uh, but it was really a, a very important field in medicine, uh, uh, that is medical botany. Every medical school, self-respecting medical school in Britain and the United States, and no doubt in France as well, had a professor of medical botany and uh, of, of, um, uh, of, of botany itself, or botanical medicine and of botany. Okay. So let me now turn to my second subject, that is public goods and plant nationalism. So were there incentives for plant innovation in the absence of the patentability of plants? You bet there were. The incentives came from a spirit, a public spirited nationalism concerned with plants as what we would call public goods. In the half century or so following the American Revolution, plant improvement drew increasing attention among the kinds of men, notably merchants, lawyers, ministers, natural philosophers, physicians, and natural historians, and well-to-do farmers in the Middle Atlantic region and the East, but also some parts of the South, such as South Carolina, who had helped lead the movement for independence or who came to maturity in its wake. They formed societies for the promotion of agriculture in a number of the new states, including Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and South Carolina. They recognized the essential importance of establishing the new nation on a solid economic as well as political footing. Plants, including fruit trees and vines, loomed large in their thinking. Among some, like Jefferson, whom we can now turn to, among some like Jefferson because of their agrarian predilections, but among all because the cultivation of plants, along with animals of course, was in those days how most Americans gained their livings and put food on their tables, and because plants at the time were the overwhelming source of medications. Bot um, Bigelow's book, for example, Materia Medica, uh, and other publications of Materia Medica are about 95% plants, only about a few percent chemicals. Since the first years of, of settlement, importation had been the principal means of improving beyond the edible plants that Native Americans knew well. That is, in importation is a source of innovation. But what the Native Americans knew well and taught the, colon the early colonists about was corn and sweet potatoes as well as peanuts, peppers, tomatoes, multiple types of squash and beans, and a few small fruits. Finding, however, the new Eden inadequate to their appetites, the colonists enlarged and diversified the agricultural mix by importing cattle, pigs, and sheep, edible vegetables, fruits, and fibers from the old world and the southern regions of the new one. <coughs> Now, in the wake of the revolution, members of the urban elites in cities up and down the east and east coast became plant nationalists. Their fortunes made or accumulating, they bought and cultivated large farms, turning some of them into opulently improved estates. They drew on the knowledge and practices of the recent agricultural revolution here in England that was marked the latter half of the 18th century. To the end of agricultural improvement, they imported fine breeds of animals and plants from Europe, built vast greenhouses for fruits and flowers, planted huge orchards with scores of varieties of the same trees. Building on long-standing tradition in the colonies, a number of them planted and maintained private botanical gardens, both for direct decorative and usually medicinal purposes. In New York City, in 1801, a prominent young physician named David Hasek, whom you see here, established what he would become a flagship public botanic garden on 20 acres in rural Manhattan. He called it the Elgin Botanical Garden, and there it is, circa 1810. Elgin, he named it Elgin because that's where his family came from in Scotland. <coughs> He intended it, Hasek intended its program of work primarily for the improvement of medicine and agriculture and decoration. 
The garden failed after a while for lack of funding, but it was an important initiative and an inspiration uh, elsewhere in the United States. By the by, I, sh I will tell you as a kind of footnote to this, uh, that uh, it went to Columbia University eventually around 1812 or so. Uh, Columbia let the garden decline, go to seed, so to speak, uh, and built uh, properties on it that it could rent. Ultimately, it rented the place, the, the land to the, Rock, to the Rockefeller interest that built Rockefeller Center on it. Uh, it was sold for $400 million to the Rockefellers in uh, about 1985. Then they turned around and sold it to a Japanese firm for $2 billion in the early 21st century. Hasek paid about $15,000 for it. <coughs> Hasek's ambitions in the plant uh, world found an additional outlet in the New York Horticultural Society, which he helped establish in 1818, and which was a harbinger of a mounting enthusiasm for horticulture uh, in the United States. By the 1830s, the New York Society was one among, among at least two dozen such organizations, including those founded in Pennsylvania uh, in 1828 and in 1829, the Massachusetts Horticultural Society. At regular meetings, the Massachusetts Society, of the Massachusetts Society, members proudly exhibited their fruits, flowers, and vegetables, offered prizes for the best fruits, shared seeds and science with their fellow cultivators, and feasted on bibulous multi-course dinners, downing large quantities of Madeira. The toast offered at the New York Society's banquets extolled the services to horticulture of Army and Navy officers. Beginning in 19, 1819, the federal government encouraged uh, naval officers and consular officials to bring back plants and seeds from their far-flung travels, and they did at times to the great benefit of American horticulture. Uh, Courtney has already alluded to this. Uh, let me just fill it out a little bit. In 1828, Joel Poinsett obtained a gorgeous red-flowered plant in Mexico, where he was the first U.S. minister plenipotentiary to the New Republic. An avid enthusiast of botany, Poinsett sent the plant that would become his namesake to Bartram's Nurseries in Philadelphia for cultivation, and the firm introduced it to the public in 1829. Federal encouragement of plant importation was given a sharp boost by Henry Ellsworth at the Patent Office beginning in the mid-1830s, Courtney has ably and excellently recounted this important initiative. Let me just tie it to what I've been telling you by saying, by emphasizing that Ellsworth, a graduate of Yale and the son of the second U.S. Chief Justice, Oliver Ellsworth, was a scion of exactly the post-revolution generation of plant nationalists whom I have described. He was also, as Courtney has pointed out, a politically savvy Jacksonian Democrat who understood that the, resent, the resentment of monopolies, including patent monopolies in the United States. Uh, he created the agricultural division in the patent office so as better to enable the office to serve the wider public. But as Courtney points out, has pointed out by the later 19th century, the program faced increasing opposition across the agricultural spectrum, but especially from commercial seedsmen. Which brings me to my, the next section of my talk, commerce, both in seeds, seeded plants, that is plants that are sexually reproduced, and in uh, asexually reproduced plants, meaning fruit trees and vines in the main, but also one might add uh, plants, uh, flowers like roses. And what I'm going to do here is to, set, is to suggest a couple of things. First of all, I'm going to suggest that what I'm going to address what my understanding of IP broad, okay? Uh, and it has something to do with Greg's definition of it, but not everything. It's a different type of IP broad, different ways of protecting intellectual property, if you will. Uh, and what I, uh, what I want to uh, stress here is that I'm going to historicize which I, uh, the notions of IP broad. That is, I think that it's important not to take as given in all times and all places IP broad, uh, as valuable a concept as it is, but to try to tease out how IP broad comes to into being. Okay? 
And I'm going to tell you this story in the case of both the, the sexually reproduced plants and the asexually reproduced ones. Uh, for the American case, not to be provincial, but I only have time to talk about the American case, but to suggest that the American case here about IP broad coming into being, that is historicizing it, might give some ideas about how to deal with it in other countries at other times. So to turn to the commercial scene of plants uh, in America in the 19th century. Uh, and earlier, the number of commercial seed houses and nurseries was small well into the first half of the 19th century in the United States, and among the likely reasons was the biology of plant reproduction. Once bought, fruit trees and vines could be asexually reproduced from scions and cuttings, reducing dependence on nurseries. Sexually reproducing plants of course generate seeds and the seeds could be saved by purchase by the purchaser for the next year's planting, a combination of biological fact and human practice that minimized the need to purchase seed. Farmers and gardeners could also obtain seed for standard and new varieties of field grains and vegetables by acquiring a neighbor's excess. They were also likely disinclined to buy seeds because it was difficult to know with much, if any, confidence their identity, that is, what plant or plants they would produce or their quality or whether they would germinate properly and produce a worthy crop free of weeds. So there are a lot of incentives for farmers not to buy, to turn to seed houses or nurseries. Still, there were incentives for them to turn to commercial seed firms and nurseries. They were, the seed firms and nurseries were the principal sources of new varieties, acting as clearinghouses in a generally free-flowing foreign and domestic exchange of plants and seeds in this period. They obtained both not only directly from abroad, but from government expeditions or federal officials like Joel Poinsett, who brought an enthusiasm for plants to their foreign post and from local farmers and gardeners. Then too, while asexual reproduction yielded genetically identical fruit trees and vines, the biology of sexual reproduction that enabled the saving of seed for the next year's crop likely also encouraged farmers and especially gardeners to turn to the seed houses. The farmers or gardeners' seeds, themselves the products of random sexual reproduction in the field or garden, would yield a next generation that varied widely in quality. Unless the grower selected and planted every year only the seed from the best plants in his crop, his production would tend to decline over time in quantity and quality. But if he engaged in such, such selection, he would be removing his best produce from what he could sell or consume. Thus, to maintain the vitality of their crops, farmers and gardeners faced a recurrent need for fresh seed that they might obtain from neighbors or seed houses or both. Commercial seed houses and nurseries were first established in the late 18th century in the American colonies and then states. They served mainly a local clientele, but beginning about the 1830s, the commerce of seeds began changing. I don't know how we got David Landreth up there. Well, okay, hope we leave him there. It began changing in tandem with the transformation of the American economy. The transportation revolution, the building, that is the building of canals and railroads, established regional and then national markets. While many farmers continued to save seed from one year's crop for planting in the next, the incentive to purchase seed arising from the biological economy of sexual reproduction was likely intensified in the post-Civil War decades by mechanization, expansion of farm size, and accelerating urbanization. An increasing market developed for grain and staple crop seed as well as for vegetables. Judged by the content of seed catalogs, demand appears to have risen especially sharply among urban and rural kitchen gardeners and among market gardeners, that is, growers who supply the rising demand for vegetables and flowers of the country's rapidly expanding cities and their emerging suburbs. This mounting demand helped change the seed industry. While several of the original firms went out of business, several of their contemporaries to continue to flourish. 
notably the seed house of David Landreth and his descendants in Philadelphia. A young immigrant uh, from London uh, in 1884, uh, Landreth had opened his seed business in Philadelphia that year, announcing in a newspaper advertisement that he offered a fresh importation of choice garden seeds. By the 1820s, the firm, which had opened a branch in Charleston, South Carolina, was known from Boston to New Orleans and was shipping sizable quantities of seeds to British India. It was perhaps the largest seed house in the nascent industry, with a farm for the production and testing of seed on the city's outskirts and a five-story, three-store, three-storefront wide warehouse at its center. The expansion of the industry was accompanied by increasing competition, which placed a premium on offering multiple plant varieties every year, and each year a number of new varieties, what people in the trade called novelties. Through much of the century, the seed houses continued to obtain novelties, mainly by importation. But an increasing fraction of them came from domestic sources, that is, seed growers and farmers. Only some of the novelties were the products of deliberate hybridization. Such efforts, that is hybridization, were likely too costly to be widely pursued, requiring, after all, commitments of land and time, and, uh, and having an outcome that was too uncertain to warrant the investment. Most plant innovation tended to arise from the plots of cultivators who found new varieties in their fields or gardens. These were the products of chance crossings or natural mutations, and the farmers and gardeners then selected them for propagation. Now, to be sure, in the seed business, innovators, via selection, could be victimized by the biology of sexually reproducing plants, no less than those who practice hybridization. <coughs> The fact, that is, the fact that the plants generated the seeds and the, the seeds could be saved by the purchaser for the next year's planting. But the disincentives to innovation were no doubt far greater for hybridization with its heavy cost and for selection. Varietal improvement by selection was, in fact, a byproduct of the grower's primary purpose, the production of crops or seeds, while hybridization was not. Landreth, for example, found and developed several money-making novelties from its own fields, notably new varieties of peas, cabbages, and pearl onions that by maturing early advantaged the farmer in the produce market. So, as the seed industry expanded, it came to be marked by meretricious and even fraudulent practices, and here I come to the key, key points in my notion of the importance of historicizing uh, the development of IP of any kind, but especially IP broad. So there we have meretricious and fraudulent practices with the, with the nationalization of the market and, the, and its heightened competition. Various firms reportedly sold impure batches of seed, bags, boxes, and paper packages that contained seeds of varieties different from those on the labels or were adulterated with weeds, or seeds that could not be counted on to germinate, and that if they did germinate, produced low-yielding or low-quality crops. These practices were not too difficult to pull off since it was virtually impossible to tell simply by inspection what plant or plant quality a seed would produce. One thinks of by analogy of a bottle of a wine of wine labeled say Chateau Lafitte that upon drinking proves to be a blend, a blend of mediocre varietals or worse. Landris promoted itself and its seeds in contradistinction to these practices, touting its offerings as a reputable and reliable brand. And here is another example, I think, of IP broad, the development of brand identification in the 19th century. So, here we have uh, an illustration of, for example, that it warranted the freshness of its seeds on the labels of the small boxes and packages in which it sold them, 
And here, so down the bottom, you see Warranted Fresh and Genuine uh, by David Landreth, etc. And it also identified itself uh, with uh, American nationalism, drawing on its origins in revolutionary Philadelphia to make the Liberty Bell its graphic logo. Okay. Some competitors faulted, let's see if there's any more of this. No, okay, we'll come to this. Some competitors faulted Landris for excessively exploiting its reputation and longevity, adding to boot that their prices were too high. Landris derided the accusation, defending its commitment to quality seeds precisely in terms of the biological economy of sexual reproduction. And Greg mentioned earlier the, uh, uh, the presumptive arrogance, say, of the new uh, Mendelian geneticists uh, uh, claiming that the, the practitioners of, uh, of innovation in, uh, in the pre-Mendelian era in the market uh, didn't know what they were doing. They certainly knew what they were doing, and here's a very good example of it. So here is an ad in the 1887 catalog of Landris, Purity Preserved. So the idea is the, the purchaser wants seeds that are reliable and going to produce well. So it is natural both in animals and vegetable life for stock to run out, meaning to degenerate. The cattle breeder understands this, purchases new animals, the wool grower buys expensive bucks, the horseman breeds to noted studs. If this were not observed, our boasted herds and flocks would become worse than unprofitable. So it is with seeds. And by the way, that first paragraph is a kind of succinct overview of practices in 19th century American agriculture. So it is with seeds, and such has always been our practice. Peas being derivative plants show a constant tendency to revert and can only be maintained in purity by annual selection, needing the watchful eye and ready hand to remove all degenerate vines. It may be said that others can do this, sometimes they do, but in 99 cases in 100 they do not, as the process of selection takes time and the diminished yield seems money out of pocket. He knew what he was talking about. So, given the effort uh, invested by Landris in maintaining the purity and quality of its seeds, uh, he defend, Landreth defend, the Landreth firm defended the, high, the, the relatively high prices by saying uh, the best is certainly the cheapest This, in its catalogs. Landreth gradually discovered that it had to protect not only its brand, that form of IP broad, but what it intuitively perceived as its intellectual property avant la lettre. The discovery arose from its efforts to defend its brand against frauds and cheats. That is, sellers who offered seeds under Landreth's name that were not Landreth seeds. The firm was particularly exercised to protect the brand identity of several varieties that had originated in its test farms, including Landreth's Bloomsdale spinach and Landreth's winter wheat. It was passionate about protecting Landreth's extra early peas, which was a kind of, of heirloom for the firm that it had introduced in 1823, and so it noted in an 1883 catalog, had, quote, since kept in, in the, had since been kept in their original purity by unceasing labor and attention. So Landreth adopted a three-pronged strategy to protect its offerings. Taking advantage of the new federal trademark law, which had been enacted in 1881, it trademarked the Liberty Bell logo and the brand names Landreth and Landreths. Beginning in 1878, it also uh, it, so, it began selling each of, of the three varieties of its valuable plants in distinctive labeled papers, which is the word they use for seed packets, papers, boxes, and bags. The pen and spinach seed, the pea and spinach seeds, moreover, were shipped in respectively, well, before that. So here you see the package up there. And you can see under there, the best is the cheapest. Uh, and the, the boxes are marked Landris, and they're sealed. And if you don't buy them, 
If, you, if they're offered to you for sale in a box that's not Marx Landris with the logo, etc., and they're not sealed, basically the idea is don't buy them. They could be fraudulent. The pea and the spinach seeds, moreover, were shipped in respectively red and blue muslin bags. Here's an example of one. Uh, Landris celebrated extra early peas. Landris uh, uh, is labeled uh, on the bag. Uh, and the wheat in white duck bags. All were fastened, as the catalog said, with wire and lead seal, bearing the stamp Landreth Philadelphia trademark. The firm claimed that its system of selling the peas and spinach in sealed bags of special color and bearing the trademark was registered with a commissioner of patents, and it put readers on notice that, quote, all infringements will be prosecuted under the law. Landris spotlighted its protective strategies in its advertising. Well, here's another example of the bag on the lower right. Okay? Here we see the protective strategy bold, uh, spotlighted in its advertising with the, the declaration in its catalog, Beware of Deception, in bold caps. And warning would-be buyers of its Bloomdale spinach, Beware of spurious seed under this name, none genuine except in our sealed bags and packages. Landreth noted that it guaranteed its lead-sealed bags of seeds only so long as the seal remains unbroken and that any extra early peas offered loose in bulk as Landreth are fraudulent, end quote. Landreth gave no quarter in protecting its brand, successfully suing a grower in Wisconsin who sold seeds under his trademark name. The firm touted its victory uh, in a circular that you see here printed in its rural register in Almanac for 1887, declaring that it had gained a ruling in a trademark case in the U.S. Court of the Eastern District of Wisconsin, under which it was protected in the exclusive use of the seed-dealing designation of Landreth or Landreths, as attached to a seed package, circular, price list, or advertisement. The firm made clear that anyone selling or advertising seeds its Landreths without authorization would be subject to injunction and damages, adding that the company would not hesitate to take steps to enjoin all who improperly make use of our name. Landris proclaimed, this decision is of value to every seedsman of reputation as it equally protects others with ourselves. The protection covered every reputable, I keep hitting this, sorry. Protection covered every reputable seedman's brand name. Landris called it his recognized firm designation as an indicia of his issue, which uh, meant basically the brand name, and safeguarded him somewhat in the enjoyment of his skill and application. The skill and application was shorthand for the investment of time, knowledge, and effort in the selection and propagation of new varieties that would advantage both growers in their production for market and seed houses in the profits of their businesses. Landris' resort to the new trademark law was emblematic of the drive then beginning toward privatization, that is, the protection of intellectual property by multiple means, but especially through the law in the material objects of the living world. Let me now, in conclusion, turn very briefly to the case of asexually reproducible plants, fruit trees and vines. The drive <clears throat> to privatize intellectual property was no less energetic in the branch of the plant industry occupied by asexually reproducible organisms, notably fruit trees and vines, as I've said. Through the 19th century, the fruit industry, like the seed industry, grew ever more national, impersonal, and competitive, and was increasingly beset by misrepresentation, fraud, and misappropriation. Why was this so? Well, the main reason was that fruit trees and vines could be reproduced identically by asexual methods, such as the grafting of cuttings onto rootstocks. Yet, yet with these methods, they could also be numerously multiplied, which facilitated theft of the developer's intellectual property. Competitors could and did purchase the trees or vines or take cuttings of them from someone's nursery in the dead of night, then propagate and sell them, usually under another name. They, so the fruit trees and vine people recognize that a good apple by any other name would be taste as sweet. 
The situation was not unlike that of digitized films and music in our own day. Nurserymen did not use the phrase intellectual property, but they certainly had the concept, they re just as Landris did. They repeatedly contended that they failed to receive just returns for all their investment of time and money. Among them was Luther Burbank, whom you've heard about earlier this afternoon from Zahn. Largely forgotten today, he was really famous during the, that period as a breeder uh, of new fruits in Santa Rosa, California. Rank, Americans ranked him, in fact, um, um, <clears throat> with Edison and Ford. You see him here on the, let's see, you're right, and there's Edison in the middle, I'm sorry, Burbank is on the left, Edison's in the middle, and Ford is on the right. They ranked him with Edison and Ford in the pantheon of American inventors. There was even a word, a verb, uh, in the dictionary, standard dictionary of the day, called to Burbank, uh, which meant to hybridize new plants. But his fame was no defense against the ripping off of his stock. Burbank fulminated to the readers of Green's Fruit Grower that he had been, quote, robbed and swindled out of my best work by name thieves, plant thieves, and in various ways too well known to the originator. Under the circumstances beginning in the 1870s and with mounting insistence in the 1890s, American nurserymen began urging the establishment of legal protection for what Burbank and his fellow fruitmen called the rights of originators. Some of the agitation aimed to find protection in the patent system, some of it aimed at protection via trademarks. However, since the mid-19th century, A series of court decisions had turned the Enlightenment notion of common rights in nature into concrete legal doctrine. The nurseryman's move to patentability was blocked when in 1889, in ex parte Latimer, the U.S. Commissioner of Patents rejected an application for a patent to cover a fiber identified in the needles of a pine tree, declaring that it would be unreasonable and impossible to allow patents upon the trees of the forest and the plants of the earth. The commissioner's ruling articulated what came to be known, has come to be known as the product of nature doctrine. That while processes devised to extract what is found in nature can be patented, objects discovered there or bred from there cannot be. Perhaps the leading advocate of trademark protection was Stark Brothers Nurseries and Orchards, which was located in Louisiana, Missouri on the Mississippi River just across from Illinois. The town was tiny, its current population is about 3,300 people, but the firm, which was established in about 1816, was one of the largest and oldest in the U.S. Now, Stark was not a breeder of new fruit varieties. Stark Brothers obtained them by sponsoring an annual fair that encouraged farmers to submit their good fruits, including those arising from chance finds in the fields, which is where most of them arose, for competitive judgment. In 1893, through this means, the firm learned about an apple tree that had cropped up on a farm in Iowa and that produced a luscious red fruit. The next year, it bought the tree with all the propagation rights, which is to say all its IP from its owner, named the fruit the delicious apple, and proceeded to market the tree to the world. Uh, there we go. There's the delicious, okay, in a Stark catalog. The Starks trademarked the delicious apple and other fruits using the trademark law that Congress had passed in 1881 that I've already mentioned. In the 1890s, the Stark catalogs included colored illustrations of their named fruits with a small banner beneath each, declaring that it was covered by a trademark, or in the case of the gold plum, the rights for which it had bought from Luther Burbank, that it was trademark patented February 25th, 18. 95. So you don't get, uh, you get a kind of overprotection there. Uh, and also mis a misleading uh, identification of the, of the protection. The trademark, however, was a very weak type of protection. It did not prevent someone from obtaining the tree or cuttings from it, propagating it, and then selling the tree under a different name. In fact, <clears throat> Moreover, uh, in fact, in 1895, in a case called Hoyt v. et al. v. J.T. Lovett Company, 
a federal court held that trademarks could not cover living products as such because like the grape that was at issue here, they were not made by man but grew out of the earth on their own. Early in the 20th century, unhappy with the state of affairs, the leading nurseries in the U.S. formed a lobby group, the National Committee on Plant Patents under the American Association of Nurserymen. Nothing happened until 1929 when Paul Stark of Stark Brothers became chair of the committee. At the time, Stark, had, Stark Brothers had particularly pressing reasons for wanting patent protection of fruits. The reasons centered on its golden, delicious apple. Like so many of its novel predecessors, this was the chance find of a farmer in his orchard in West Virginia. During World War I, Stark had acquired the rights to the Golden Delicious, had invested considerable sums in developing it, and sold its seedlings by the hundreds of thousands all over the U.S. and in many foreign countries. To protect its IP in the Golden Delicious, Stark required every purchaser to sign a contract that he or she would neither sell nor give away science cuttings or buds. And here is another version, I think, of uh, IP broad contracts. Okay, There are other things one could talk about as well, but I won't take the time to do it. Uh, every, <clears throat> every seedling of the Golden Delicious that was shipped to any orchardist or farmer anywhere, or nurse, other nurserymen, uh, was shipped with this tag. You see the front and the back. The front is a summary of the contract, and the back is, offers a $100 reward for anybody uh, uh, producing information that leads to the conviction of someone who is violating the contract. The firm was nevertheless often subject to piracy of its trees, and even though it used the Pinkerton Detective Agency, on which it had on retainer, to ferret out thieves, found that the contract was not easy to enforce. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just say briefly, uh, right across the river was a firm called uh, the uh, Golden Eagle Nursery, whose proprietor was a guy named Alfred Schultz. He shamelessly sold the Golden Delicious, uh, and when confronted uh, by Stark, he would say, I never signed your contract, and where'd you get it? He would, and he would say, I, it's none of your business. Uh, and um, uh, he was, I've seen his letters in the Stark archives, uh, he was illiterate, but he was extremely smart uh, and understood well uh, what he was doing. And there he is on the upper left. Uh, and then uh, he, this is a citation from the ruling in Hoyt v. Lovett from 1895. And he says here, basically, who says you can own uh, intellectual property? In so many words, intellectual property rights. The court says you can't. So, Frustration over the difficulty helped energize Stark's eagerness for the strongest IP protection that a patent would provide. The Starks were very well connected politically in Missouri. In 1930, not least because of Paul Stark's connections and lobbying effort, Congress passed the Plant Patent Act that um, uh, Zahn has told you about uh, earlier. The act covered only asexually reproduced organisms, which meant mainly fruit trees and vines, as well as clonable flowers such as roses. Also, it got around the prohibition against the patenting of natural products by authorizing the grant of a patent to anyone who has, quote, invented, <clears throat> uh, as you see on the screen, invented or discovered and asexually reproduced any distinct and new variety of plant other than a tuber propagated plant, which is to protect the potato. Uh, for popular consumption. So the, the intervention of man here, okay, to, make, to do something different from what nature does, is in the asexual reproduction. The act did not grant utility patents. It required the novelty only of distinctiveness rather than usefulness. And of course it did not require disclosure because there was nothing to disclose about how the plant was reproduced, or let alone uh, devised. The nation's seedsmen, as uh, somebody mentioned earlier, had tried to persuade Stark that the act ought to cover sexually reproduced organisms too, but he had objected. For one thing, he pointed out what the seedsmen well knew, that in the state of existing biological control, the offspring of sexually reproducing plants would not necessarily resemble the plants of the first generation in character, characters and quality. Thus, plants which were grounded in the identical reproducibility of the 
protected invention could not be defended for plants reproduced sexually. For another thing, he reminded the seedsmen that the arrival of Mendelian genetics had enabled the protection of intellectual property in sexually reproduced plants via the biological strategy that had produced hybrid corn, which came along in just around World War I uh, and was uh, under, well under development by the late 20s. Recall that this strategy entailed the creation of two highly inbred lines of corn, then crossing the two lines, which is to say breeding one to the other. The resulting next generation displayed the valuable characteristics of higher yield and quality. But no less important, if the farmer planted the seeds from the offspring, the next generation would diminish in both yield and quality. Thus, if the farmer wished to reap an optimally profitable crop, he would have to repurchase purchase seed each year from the producers of the hybrid seed. He gained nothing from saving seed for the next year's plantings. The producers, on their part, could protect their intellectual property simply by maintaining the inbred lines as trade secrets. What worked for hybrid corn, Stark contended, might well work for other sexually reproduced plants as well. The seedsmen thus had no need for legal protection of their IP. And we've heard more about the patenting of hybrid seed lines uh, later, I mean, earlier this afternoon, but this is the origins of that story. So finally, let me turn, let me conclude by, by the, the turn on the part of the plant people in the United States, both asexually and sexually reproducing plants, to IP narrow. Okay? Stark's expectations for the general utility of, uh, hybrid, of hybridization for the protection of IP uh, were mistaken, at least in the short term, 20, 30 years. But the Plant Patent Act eventually assisted the seedsmen. The act was, after all, the first statute that I know of passed anywhere in the world that extended patent coverage to any living organism. It helped pave the way for the passage in 1970 of the Plant Variety Protection Act, which we've heard about, which provided IP protection for sexually reproducing plants. The PVPA was passed, as you know, in part to bring the U.S. into harmony with a European convention for similar protection that went into effect in 1968. It expressed both the ability of plant breeders by then to produce new varieties that were distinctive, uniform, and stable, the criteria for protection that the plant had to meet, and that also satisfied the felt need to integrate American plant breeding into an IP regime that was becoming increasingly global. In 1980, in the case of Diamond v. Chakrabarty, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled by five to four that a bacterium that had been genetically modified to metabolize hydrocarbons was patentable. Whether an invention was alive or not, the majority declared, was irrelevant to its patentability so long as it met the criteria of eligibility for a patent. That is, Jefferson's criteria, which remained, as I've told you, and remains at the core of the U.S. Patent Code. The key criterion was, quote, new composition of matter which the new bacterium was because its DNA, a chemical after all, had been modified. In 1985, feeling itself governed by the Chakrabarty decision, the U.S. Patent Office granted a utility patent on a plant, the genes of which had been altered, thus making it a new and useful composition of matter. But I, the IP, one must say that IP broad is still in effect. Uh, several years ago, I talked to, uh, I visited a man named Clay Logan, who was a blooded Stark, uh, uh, no longer with the firm, it had been sold. And I asked them uh, whether they were still relying, the firm was still relying on, um, was now relying on uh, uh, utility patents, apropos uh, the decision of the court in Diamond v. Chakrabarty in 1980 and the extension to plants in 1985. And he said, no. He said, in many cases, a lot of our suppliers, for example, he mentioned a firm in New Zealand that provided a, a, a new apple. They much prefer contracts to, um, uh, to patents. Why that's the case is a subject for further uh, investigation, but IP Broad is still very much with us. So at the opening of the 21st century to finish here, one could discern continuities in the evolution of plant properties since Benjamin Franklin's day. 
Innovation, for example, still depends on a global search for new varieties, what is now called bioprospecting. An unmodified nature remains available to everyone. But in a sense, Thomas Short, with his animadversions against chemistry, had been thwarted. Plants had become chemistry, at least for their agricultural and medicinal advantages. And the intellectual property protection that now claimed them had steadily encroached on the natural commons dear to Franklin and his circle. With the plant enterprise increasingly energized by returns on investment measured in dollars, pounds, euros, and whatever other currency you want to name, the free-flowing exchange of the post-revolution plant nationalist period in the U.S. had given way to a new regime of privatization, itself a product of the interactions of scientific knowledge, profit-oriented enterprise, the biology of plants themselves, and law with the American political economy in a very much globalizing world. Thank you.